Hello, everyone, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. This is where we talk with uh, business leaders about how they're building resilience in these challenging times. And my guest today is Ethan Diamond. He's the founder and CEO of Bandcamp. It's an online record store and music community where about 80% of sales actually go directly to the musicians. And Bandcamp saw pretty incredible growth since it was uh, since this past year. Uh, we'll get into that in a bit more. Um, Ethan, welcome. It's great having you. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Um, and before we get into it, Ethan, if you are watching this, however you're watching this on Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or YouTube or whatever, uh, and you'd like to submit questions to Ethan about Bandcamp, um, if you're a fan and you just want to tell Ethan how much you love Bandcamp, because bands, it's like one of those things. It's like an obsession. People love it. Um, send us a note and we'll try to, uh, we'll try to let Ethan know. Um, so first of all, Ethan, tell us, tell, for people who aren't familiar with Bandcamp, can you explain how it works? Sure, sure. Well, I, you know, as you said, we're uh, essentially an online record store and music community where fans connect with artists and directly support them. And uh, about half the business is uh, is physical records, so vinyl, uh, cassettes, CDs, um, a lot of T-shirts as well. And then half the business is uh, digital music, so people buying uh, buying digital albums and um, and and digital tracks directly from the artist. And we also recently launched uh, live streaming. So now tickets are part of it as, as well. But, um, you know, I would say that the thing that, uh, that really sets us apart is that um, we've, we've just built the whole company around the welfare of the artist. So we don't, uh, we don't sell advertising. We don't really focus on subscriptions. We just help artists um, sell their music. And then we um, take a small uh, revenue share on every sale. So you know, the, what I like to say is that we only make money um, if artists make a lot more money. And, you know, that sort of alignment of, uh, of interest that we have um, built into our business model is really just everything that we're about. I would, I, you know, we're, I would say an artist first music company. And, and something like 85% in, in, on average of the revenue goes directly to the artist, right? Yeah, it's, it ends up being, uh, so there's, there's payment processing fees and then right. there's Bandcamp's fee. So on our, and it varies by transaction size, but on average, it, it uh, comes out to about 82% that uh, goes to, uh, directly to the, uh, to the artist. And then we pay that out uh, every, it usually takes about 24 to 48 hours. Wow. I, I've heard it described a little bit like Etsy for, for independent music. Is that a fair comparison? Totally. Yeah. I, and which I take as a compliment, right? I think that that's, um, I think it's a really good comparison. Uh, Etsy and Bandcamp are both uh, really large marketplaces um, that uh, I think really focus on supporting the creators. Yeah, I buy a lot of stuff of Etsy actually this past year. Um, all right, so so in the late '90s, one of my favorite books, um, which is when I, when I reread it now, rethink about it now, it's a little bit dated just because of the content. But it was at the time I was a younger man. It was High Fidelity. I love that book by Nick Hornby. Yeah. I even like the movie, even though it didn't take place in it took place in Chicago, not in the UK. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and so were, was that you? Like the, you launched this in two thousand seven. Was right. that you? Like was that were you that guy? Were you like I'm going to launch an independent record store online? And what? How did you come up with the idea? Hmm, well, yeah, I don't know if uh, it wasn't quite. The thought initially wasn't really a record store. It more evolved, it, it evolved into that. So I'll, I'll take you through it. So ba basically what happened is uh, about 13 years ago, um, there was a band uh, that I loved and they decided that, um, you know, they were going to sell their new record uh, directly to their fans on their own website. And on the day that that record came out, I went to their site and the site just didn't load at all. Huh. Huh. And I thought, oh, they must, you know, they must be slammed. I'll come back the next day yeah. and uh and the site loaded on that day but it loaded very very slowly um and this was also in the days of flash everything was flash yeah. so you know it was, took took a while to figure out exactly what was going on on the site but eventually i i bought the album and um but then i didn't actually get anything <laughs> you know the transaction went through but no no music so it was never sent to you or, or was like a digital it was going to be a digital yeah, download? This was a digital a digital album what right? was the band by the way can you can oh you know what i 
I don't want to call them out because kind of the point is that it this was a lot of bands at this point, and right. I, feel, I feel a little bit bad. So uh, fine, yeah. fair enough. Okay, so so I wrote, you know, I wrote to there was an email address on the site, and I wrote to the um, the address, and uh, I think it was the lead singer who wrote me back, and wow. he he just sent me a link to a zip file, a no, totally open zip file that you know anybody could then share. And, um, and then I opened that up and there were all these, uh, all of these files with names like master three final. <laughs> yes. yes. Super, super low quality, no liner notes, nothing. And, you know, I just basically in this process ran, uh, ran into like every technical problem that you could imagine. Yeah. And that just, it killed me because for two reasons, you know, one, um, I, I, the music was amazing. And I thought the artist, uh, you know, I thought they deserved all the success in the world. And, you know, when you love right. an artists, right, you want everybody else to hear them. Right. So, but right. I knew like, as a result of all these problems, very few other people would. Um, but I, you know, the other thing that killed me about it was, um, that I thought that what they were doing, um, just made so like, it made perfect sense. You know, of course, an artist should be able to go directly to their fans for support. Um, the internet makes that super easy. This is the promise of it, I think. And, 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 and I also think it just creates this mutual, that direct uh, connection creates this mutually beneficial relationship because not only does the artist need get to uh, make more music uh, when I pay them, but also I get to feel like I'm participating in the creation of more of the art that I love. So I'm more directly connected to that music. But, uh, you know, this was 2007 and there were just, there were just no mechanisms like yeah. this for, for musicians. There was, there was, um, MySpace, MySpace that, yeah. that was, um, you know, they didn't have a way through MySpace to sell directly to fans. Right. And, um, and it wasn't really your site. It was, you know, their logo, a bunch of their advertising. It was their right. traffic, their whole identity. Right. And, um, and then so you had like all of these forward thinking bands, in my opinion, uh, who were spending a lot of time, a lot of money building out custom sites and then ending up with something that, you know, uh, didn't really work. And, you know, I, I found that particularly crazy because if you again, in 2007, if you were a writer, you had blogger, type pad, movable, right. type, all these things that let you set up your own site very, very quickly and easily. And then it would say like powered by movable type in the bottom, yeah, right? right? But it was yours, right? Yeah. And it just seems so weird that if your artistic output was words, you had all of those options. If your artistic output was music, you know, you're, you're out of luck. So, you know, I wanted to solve uh, that problem, not just for, you know, this one artist that I ran into, but for every artist. And um, so, at that point, I approached uh, my friend, a person who I had worked with on a couple of different um, startups previously, Sean Grunberger, and he joined as Bandcamp's uh, CTO. And then um, I talked to uh, an er uh, True Ventures. They're an early stage uh, venture investor in San yeah. Francisco. Um, we raised a few million dollars uh, through them. And then um, I approached two other friends of mine who I'd worked with at Adobe for many years, and they joined as the founding engineers, Joe Holt and Neil Tucker. And uh, and then we just, we got started. We Amazing. just came there. Yeah. One of the, th the, the crazy things about, I mean, there's so, so much we can talk about, the artists, and, and, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the crazy things about your business is that it's actually been profitable, I think, since 2012, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and it's actually quite amazing because if you think about, and we'll talk about Spotify in a moment, but if you think about Spotify, Spotify's valued, I don't know, like $50 billion or something like that. And they have never been profitable, right? It's never, they've never turned a profit. Um, and it's a, a company that is growing and, and focuses on growth and, and has a, a growth strategy. Um, what do, do you guys is that part of your strategy is growth and and scale and you know all these terms that you, i mean you're in san francisco you know you know these terms blitz blitz growth or blitz scale scale i mean do, does do all those terms matter to you to your to your vision for bandcamp um no <laughs> they don't no i mean we're really just i focused on our mission of serving artists that's what inspires me that's what i you know what i get excited about doing and i would say the company has grown and succeeded more as a as a side effect 
of focusing on that mission that we really have. And that to me is just, you know, that's, that's a lot more satisfying than if we, I think, took the approach of, yeah, we were focused on what our mission here is actually grow the company, get it to this size, go public, sell it, whatever it is. Um, that just hasn't really been the focus um, ever. Yeah. And, and I mean, basically from the perspective of an artist, right, you, you put your music up on band and these are artists who don't generally want to work for, with a, with a label, presumably these are artists who, who want to retain all the rights, all the master recordings. They want to control their careers. Those are the people who put their music up on Bandcamp. It's actually um, both artists uh, who are completely independent and uh, artists who are on labels. So we were at this point, we have um, almost 10,000 independent labels on the site. Uh, so um, Sub Pop, Merge, ATO, uh, Ninja Tune, Relapse, uh, just t loads and loads of independent labels. In fact, I did not even know that there were so many <laughs> you know, independent labels <laughs> in the world until um, I started working on Bandcamp. I've been blown away by that. And, you know, when I think of when a lot of people hear the word label, they think of, you know, Sony, Warner, right. Universal, right? Big, the big, the major labels. Um, but there's a huge, huge uh, number of these independent labels out there. That, and some of them are really quite large, um, like Beggars um, Group. And, uh, but, you know, a lot of them are just, you know, mom and pop kinds of uh, small businesses. And, um, and yeah, they, they, they and their artists are a big, big part of Bandcamp. So and I know that like Bjork, her catalog is on Bandcamp and Peter Gabriel, um, some of his, his work is on Bandcamp. How does it, I mean, can't, I mean, and it may be difficult for you to answer this question. You may not know, but um, given the Etsy uh, comparison, is it on average? I mean, can, do artists make a living off of their work on Bandcamp, or or is it sort of part of a bigger ecosystem of the things they do? Well, I would say that any artist should be doing uh, a lot of a lot of things. You know, right. they should be on Bandcamp and they should be in a lot of other places as well. And I think that's had the approach that almost all of them take. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of artists uh, that are on Bandcamp are uh, making significant amount of money. We hear uh, all the time, uh, mostly through Twitter, that, uh, you know, the the money that artists make uh, through Bandcamp is orders of magnitude bigger than what they're making from streaming services, um, that it's how they're, uh, you know, paying rent and getting equipment and, uh, buying groceries and all of all of that. So we're, it's clear that we're, to me, a part of um, how a ton of artists are sustaining themselves. And that's that is great. Um, I love, you know, I love hearing that. But, you know, the focus uh, for us has never been on like measuring, um, you know, how many people are making over this amount, how many right. people are making over this amount, because part of what makes Bandcamp Bandcamp is that, you know, anybody can sign up for it. You can sign up for it tomorrow and start five different bands. And, you know, thinking about what that would mean for like the average that each artist makes, it just starts to not make any sense that, that you would, uh, that we would measure it that way. Instead, what we really are measuring is like the total amount that fans are paying artists through the site. Is that going up? And, um, and yeah, I, I, that's that's generally been the focus. You know, Ethan, it's it's so interesting because when you when you came up with this, when you guys came up with this concept in two thousand seven, the conventional wisdom was that no one is going to pay for music in the future. This was just like in the sort of post Napster era, and it was sort of pre Spotify. But the idea was that no one was going to pay for music in the future; that it was going to be something that you just got. And yes. and to some extent, that is true, right? I mean, I mean, the sort of the major label artists make most of their money off live touring, and 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 they're you know very few of them are making a lot of money off Spotify. Obviously, the biggest ones are. How did you know? I mean. How did you know that people would be willing to pay for this music? Or did you know? I mean, were you at any point worried that people just wouldn't wouldn't pay for it? Yeah, I know that was definitely the hunch at the beginning because I, that's what I wanted personally. You know, I wanted to have that direct relationship with an artist and directly support them. And I figured there's got to be other people out there who want to do it this way and who want to um, directly support ours, but there's just there's no way to do it. It's not easy to do. And, um, and there was a moment um, early on that I think where everything clicked. And that was um, when we were looking at the search terms that people were using to get to Bandcamp that ultimately ended in a sale. And we found, uh, again, 
back this is 2008 2009 so we, what we were competing with right as you said was like limewire right hook share and mm -hmm. stuff like that so we looked at those search terms and it was the name of an album plus the word torrent or the name of an artist plus you know free mp3 or yeah. you know something like that and so you know, I don't know that the people who were using those search terms were necessarily thinking to themselves, I want to get this music for free or you know, steal this music. But when they got to a place, Bandcamp, where it was clear that they, if they bought here, they were directly supporting an artist, that actually led to a sale. So that moment where we saw those kinds of search terms resulting in money getting to artists was really the moment where it felt like, oh yeah, this is going to work. Um, I know that your growth has been slow and steady and consistent over time and and last year was a was a a huge growth year we'll talk about in a moment but it seems to me that that you have what you've built is a company that is sustainable where you're able to pay people a you know a decent salary no one's no one's no one's a billionaire out of bandcamp um but i have to imagine that there've been times over over the past 10 years where you have been approached by bigger companies that want to buy you or investors who want to pump more money into the company to, to grow it. Um, and, and that can be tempting for an entrepreneur because, you know, you've got people who work for you and there's a lot of pressure to grow and build and scale. And, and, and I wonder how you have resisted that kind of pressure to, to do that. Well, yes. Um, you know, before the pandemic uh, hit, we had regular meetups uh, all the time with artists and labels uh, around the around the world, really. And the the most common thing that um, that I heard uh, from people, you know, direct from artists and labels uh, during those meetings, were things like, you know, "Hey, I just wanted to come over and say, please don't ever sell the company. You're our last hope." You know, things things like that, and. You know, I, I take that responsibility that, you know, the, the, the service that we are now providing to artists and labels, to, I take it, you know, it's a really, it's a responsibility I take very, very seriously. So, you know, we would, I think, really only um, align ourselves with uh, another company um, that, that had the welfare of the artist in mind in this, in this same way. And, um, and yeah, I, you know, taking money, um, it can sometimes... It's a, it can sometimes change, you know, change your goals, change them to, you know, growth at all costs. And so getting, as you said, to, you know, getting to profitability, that was a really important milestone for us. We wanted to make, we wanted to do that because we wanted to be able to retain control of the company and know that this mission that we have um, would be around long-term. Yeah. You know, a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs are looking to build community around their products and there's a whole you know, there there are there are sort of sessions and and edu you know educational opportunities and, and founders are looking to figure out how do you build community, 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 and everyone seems to want to build a media company these days. But um, it's it's something that's very difficult to just build to to kind of create out of nothing, right? Especially if it's inauthentic. It, it, and I know that your the sort of the cent central one of the central forces of Bandcamp is the community. And, and it seems to me that the community has really kind of driven the business decisions that you make, right? Like there are fan accounts and there's a social media interface where you can see what other people are buying and listening to. And the community, I mean, especially when you talk about independent music, like they, uh, they have strong views on what it means to sell out and to compromise. Um, so how much does the community, I mean, how much does the community matter in terms of how you guys think of what what you do yeah this this gets back to your earlier question about um about you know the high fidelity and you know being that record store because when we started off i i, I forgot to mention this when i was telling you the story of, of that start when we started um because myspace was kind of the reference point where the community had um devolved essentially into people spamming each other's pages with their own flyers and saying thanks for the ad and things like that <laughs> Um, we decided that there wasn't going to be no community on Bandcamp, zero. <laughs> you know, there's, there was just, we were essentially a white label service. In those early days, we were a white label service for artists, and that was it. 
And, um, and then people's, you know, after a couple of years of doing this and there were, there were enough artists on the site where people started to say, you know, um, Hey, could you tell me, you know, what are the other like math rock, uh, bands that are on Bandcamp? And my reaction at first was, you know, why do you, I don't understand why you care, you know, just use, use Google type math rock into Google and go right. find other bands. Right. And, but then once, you know, once we'd gone from maybe 10,000 bands to a hundred thousand bands, it started to really make sense to me that there was an opportunity here, that there was a group of people of like-minded fans who want to directly support artists and directly connect with them in this way. And that we have a chance to help facilitate that. Right. So we started building the community up, but very carefully and around the idea that the community is that you, your your ticket to participate in this community is that you're an actual supporter of these artists. So you don't, you know, click a like button or a heart to add something to a collection. You have to, you transact right yeah. to create a collection and that gives the collection so much more meaning, right? Because you actually spent a limited resource, right? Your money to create this collection. So, you know, that's become um, just an incredibly important part of the business. It drives something like 30 uh, plus percent of the sales. So meaning, you know, if you as an artist are adding your music to the site, you know, you can expect that, that community to find you and draw and that you benefit from that in a way that would be very different from you just setting up, you know, your own um, standalone site. So, yeah, I, um, I, I feel like the community has gone from something that, you know, I, I thought, you know, it's just an annoyance to at first, you know, again, based on MySpace to something that um, is really uh, a key to the entire thing. Um, I, I know that last year was a, a huge year for you. But by the way, what kind of growth did you see in 2020 in terms of, yeah, just overall growth? Um, it was enormous. I mean, it was uh, it, the site that everything more or less doubled in, in 2020. Um, you know, artist signups, fan signups, sales through the site, digital, wow. music, physical music. Yeah. And I'm imagining, presumably, because people were stuck at home. We saw we saw that with, with our shows, too, that the, the number of, of listeners increased. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and I know that last year you started something called Bandcamp Fridays, where uh, I think you started pretty pretty soon after the like the shutdown in San Francisco, which was March seventeenth. I think yeah. that Friday you you basically um, had this Bandcamp Friday, which which was a day where all of the proceeds, except for the processing fees, go to the artists. So you guys waive your 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 commission. And it was huge. Like, like you, did, you you sold like four and a half million dollars worth of music in like twenty four hours. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, we and it happened very very quickly. You know, the 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 pandemic hit, the shutdown happened. We realized, okay, artists are losing a huge part of their. Many artists are losing a huge part of their income. What can we? You know, this is our community. What can we do to help? We've had successful fundraisers in the past, um, like when the the former president had the Muslim ban travel ban. We had a really successful fundraiser for ACLU. Uh, the former president had um, the transgender military ban, and we held a, a very successful fundraiser for the um, transgender law center. Uh, we've done others, and it just felt like, okay, well, what's what are we going to do? What's the organization that we should um, support uh, this time? Should it be something in um, helping support the venues that are shut down, helping maybe support artist uh, health care. And ultimately what we settled on was yes, yeah, something very simple, which is yes, waiving our revenue share. Uh, and we scrambled to do that. Uh, we had our first one on March 20th of last year. And uh, it, you know, it was, it was huge. It was, uh, it was about 15 times our normal Friday sales, wow. which, um, for the systems team, for support, for the developers, every, it was a really um, a, a big effort to uh, to keep the site running and, and have it keep up with all of that. But you know, obviously, the benefit to artists was enormous. And since then, we've had we have another one tomorrow, but we've had eleven since then. And just on those days, fans have paid artists uh, fifty million dollars through the site. Wow. I, I mean, it, it is amazing and, and and incredible, and obviously aligns with your mission. But all, 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 you're also running a company that has to employ. How many employees do you have? About a hundred now. So you have to pay a hundred people and, and, and obviously help sustain their lives. So you have to be profitable. And I imagine doing that, having those band camp Fridays where you, you, you guys are getting no money, but you're still processing the fees and you still have to work 
right? To, oh, to, to make that happen. That that's yeah. that can't be easy financially for the company to absorb. You know, we were concerned at the beginning. It, we, you know, it was the first one we did. We didn't know how it was going to go at all. And we didn't know that we were going to do another one. And we didn't call it Bandcamp Friday. That's something that just happened, you know, on, on social media. People right. started calling it that. And we're like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's say embrace that and and uh, use that for all of the future ones as well. But, what, you know, what we saw after that first one is that it resulted in a lot of artists uh, driving awareness to their fans that, hey, here's a way to directly support me. And that extends past that day of the month, right? Uh, you know, on, on Bandcamp Friday, 93% of what a fan spends gets to the artist. On the other wow. days of the year, right, it's 82% on average. Yeah. So both, day, you know, all days are good days, right, to support an artist. And, and so the, the effect of these uh, days has been... Um, a, a big positive, I think, for artists overall. And then because of this alignment in uh, it, of our of our uh, business model with the interests of the artists, it actually is a huge benefit to Bandcamp as well, the company. So right. yes, we waive our revenue share on those days, but I feel like, and, and the numbers prove out that uh, it's been a net benefit for the company overall. Um, Ethan, we're getting some questions from viewers. Um... And one of the questions comes from Carlos. Um, Carlos asks, does Bandcamp provide any connection or, uh, to, to, or a network to labels and also to help protect artists from predatory contracts? We do not uh, have a service that introduces or connects uh, artists to labels, but um, I do know that there are loads of labels on the site, as I said, to about 10,000. And they tell us all the time that the way they find the artists who they end up signing um, is by looking through Bandcamp. Primarily. And but you also offer um, kind of like kind of like a platform for artists to completely manage themselves, right? I mean, in terms of the merch and the music, and even um, you know promoting their live touring. Like, if you are an artist and you 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 know and and you have some success, you can mm -hmm. decide to just be self managed, entirely self managed. I think that's true, but also really challenging and isn't really for every artist. I think that, you know, the, the labels uh, provide a really valuable service to a lot of people who just want to focus on their music and not, you know, be in constant promotion mode. And uh, and even for those art artists who are that type, I think there's expertise that a lot of the, uh, the independent labels on Bandcamp bring that, you know, is hard won over many, many years. And so, you know, I would never say, oh, this is a complete replacement, but uh, for like for any artist, but um, for some, certainly that's true. Yeah, who who um, are, I think the the type who are const you know, constantly on social media, constantly um, promoting themselves at the same time that they're making music. But that's, I think that's a, a maybe a, a more rare type of, uh, of artist. Yeah. How do you think, Ethan, the music industry will change? And in a post pandemic world, if, if at all? Well, I think, um, I think there's um, good news and bad news about that. You know, um, I'll start with the bad news. I think, uh, you know, a lot of venues have closed uh, during the pandemic. And I think a lot more um, are likely to close because uh, the, the Save Our Stages Act, the that passed, but, um, but the money hasn't been distributed yet. So I worry right. about what's gonna happen to, um, to all those venues. And in the meantime, you know, one of the crazier monopolies that exists between Live Nation, biggest venue owner, promoter, manager of artists, and Ticketmaster, um, and you know, uh, Clear Channel slash iHeart Media that owns radio, right? Uh, you know, Live Nation has uh, their their stock has tripled during the pandemic, um, and you know, you kind of wonder like, well, why why is that, right? What's going on? They haven't had a concert in in a year, and I think that's just because everybody, well, the market anyway, is expecting the sort of the stranglehold to only uh, get worse, which isn't good for us, you know, music fans, right? The ticket tickets will get more expensive. I think there will be less diversity in music as a result, but. Um, but you know laws are changing right uh you know there's a lot of an, an interest in uh in antitrust uh uh there's a lot of activity anti antitrust activity that uh that i'm 
you know, cautiously optimistic about. But, you know, the, the other the other part of the industry, I would say that the good news is that I think a lot of people have rethought uh, how to support artists during the pandemic. And there's been a, you know, a, a lot of conversation about like, well, OK, if artists aren't touring or aren't doing shows, what is the way to keep you know, keep art alive at this time and how should we be compensating artists? And, uh, and, you know, that's a conversation that, you know, I've, I feel like that's why we started Bandcamp, right? To, to, because that, because of the, those issues. So, um, to, to know that people are thinking about that and that it's changing, that there is a lot more direct support happening through platforms like ours uh, is really encouraging to me. I know, um, you've got a brick and mortar, record store in Oakland, California, and, and a live venue space there. And presumably it's, you know, it, it's been challenging to, 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 to keep those open. Um, but I wonder, given the consolidation in the industry, especially when it comes to live events, is there a world where Bandcamp in a post-pandemic world enters that space and somehow creates uh, uh, venues uh, for, you know, or, or partners with people to create indep- more independent venues for, for live events? We've thought about it for sure, and I think it's, it would be really interesting to get into. Um, you know, our, 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 I guess, toe dip into this world is our new live streaming service um, that we really just launched. We've rolled it out now to, um, it's in about 100,000 artists have been enabled with this, and it allows you to stream to your Bandcamp, uh, to anybody. So, you know, you can, you publish a show, it goes out to all of your followers, you can have an integrated merch table. And seeing some of those early shows, it's very, it's very exciting to me because people are buying the merch. There's a chat uh, that's very uh, active. And when somebody Mm -hmm. buys something, it shows up in the chat, hey, this person actually just bought this vinyl record. And then that kind of um, triggers more people to do that. And when I think about how many artists are on Bandcamp, and if it seems inevitable that we'll get to this point where all these, there'll be shows happening constantly. And you'll be able to have that experience of, you know, when you go to a town that's a music town like Austin or New, yeah. or New Orleans, right? And you walk down the street and you just hear music everywhere around yeah. you and you can pop your head in and see what's going on and potentially fall in love with a new artist, right? That, that's the experience that, um, that I think we'll soon have on Bandcamp that I'm really um, very excited about. But thinking about how that interacts with the, the real world of venues, uh, in a post-pandemic world is also, I think, exciting because there, there really is, I think, very little reason not to broadcast uh, shows from venues and open up your audience to the entire world and, uh, and see that benefit. So, yeah, getting involved in that is something that we're definitely thinking about. And it, is, that, is, that, um, is that feature something you rolled out that, that you had planned to roll out last year or, or was, the, was that feature a response to what was going on in, in the pandemic world? A hundred percent a response. Yeah. Wow. It, it was not, we weren't thinking about entering that at all. And in retrospect, it was kind of re- crazy that we weren't. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, com- it was conceived, designed and built in a very, very short period of time. We, we moved uh, several people off of other projects to get that done. Wow. And, and, and so this is a platform where people can pay some money if when the artist presumably uh, sets the, the 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 fee, the ticket prices to see a live concert. That's right. Yeah. Well, we we support ticketed shows and um, and also uh, you know it, 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 the ticketed show meaning like name your price, and then very soon we'll also be offering um, uh, the ability to just have a completely open free show. Right. And and presumably you do a free show, but you also have merchandise available for sale, and that that can sustain because I mean, because yeah. the band is a business too. Exactly. We've seen so far somewhere between like 30 and 40 percent of the overall revenue from a show uh, coming from the, the merchandise that the art, artist offers during that show. Wow. Yeah, that's so cool. And how long did it take you guys to stand that up? Uh, boy, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, I think that the time was somewhere around six or seven months. Wow. Like Which is fast. I mean, I wonder, I wonder if you, if you tried to do that in a, at another time, in a, a more stable time, like the pre pandemic world, would it have been more complicated for you guys to have rolled that out? You know, would there have been more meetings and more storm and drung about whether to do it? 
Definitely. Yes. I love the, the urgency that the pandemic created, even though I think that feature is going to be extremely valuable after the pandemic is over. I, the urgency um, I, was a really big uh, motivating factor for the team. And, and um, you know, that's actually rare for us. Uh, you know, w- w- we don't have a whole lot of deadlines in the company. You know, there aren't um, like trade shows that we're trying to get a demo ready for or anything like right. that. It just, it all happens um, pretty much at the pace of, of, getting it right and but also getting something into people's hands as quickly as we can but that is generally a slower pace than what happened with um with live which um yeah the team just really really yeah yeah Yeah, i mean to crank out a whole new feature like that in six months is fast um i I get a question here from uh, luis via linkedin luis asks are you incorporating nfts into your platform okay so um, <laughs> should, we explain, should we explain this before we go on? This is so weird. I don't fully get it, but these are non-fungible tokens. It's like basically something that can be verifiably owned by somebody through the blockchain. I'm doing a terrible job at explaining this, but people are paying millions of dollars for pieces of digital art for files and yeah. other things that can be verifiably, uh, can be proved proven that they are, that it is a... It's the only existing thing of its kind in the world. Okay, now to the I question. Yeah, um, you know, I, I I feel like if I go on record saying um, that NFTs are ridiculous or something like that, then I then then uh, then they are guaranteed to become enormous, go mainstream. Yes, become, right, right, you know, that's right. That's yeah. the way. And then that your works. your sound clip will be used in the documentary about the NFTs <laughs> in twenty years. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This idiot said, said this. Can you believe it? So, um, so I'm not going to say that. Um, instead, um, what what I'll say about it is that if we see demand um, from artists to offer them, and we also see demand from fans to buy them, um, and we can also enable them in a way that is not um, not a disaster for the environment, then um, then we would absolutely consider doing it. But so far, you know, we I don't think we've seen. That demand. If you look at, um, if you watch Twitter uh, for you know Bandcamp and NFT, which which I do, um, there are a lot of people uh, just asking like, why should they make an NFT when they already have Bandcamp? And you know, I I love that because if you think about um, why NFTs are getting so much attention right now in the in artist communities, it's because of the problems of artist compensation, and that's you know that's exactly the problem that Bandcamp was uh, was built to solve. Hmm. I still don't get it, but <laughs> neither I do still I. Don't get it. But <laughs> it would be great if we could turn this podcast into an NFT. Maybe we can do that, and the yeah. proceeds will go to NPR. So if anybody wants to bid on that, let's let's have that conversation. Yeah, and that'll show this. Me. This podcast yeah. is an NFT. If you want to give us half a million, two million, whatever, whatever, have a million, many millions you want to give us, we'll take it. You earned it, man. <laughs> we well, fortunately NPR is going to get it, but you know, um, before we go, I want to ask you. Um, I want to ask you for uh, some advice. Um, what what advice would you give to an entrepreneur who wants to run an ethical business, a mission focused business like yours? but has the opportunity to to grow it very quickly and to scale it if only they would shift their business model or their values ever so slightly what would you say to them well i guess it just completely depends on what that slight shift looks like um i I think you know my my advice and what has served us really really well has been um aligning the business model with uh, the community that we're here to serve. And if the shift still allows you to do that, um, then, you know, the only risk really is, I think is that, um, you know, the priorities of a, of a major investor aren't necessarily going to be your exact same priorities. You may have find yourself in a situation where you're pushed to sell the company or pushed to, um, to grow quickly in a way that risks your mission. Right. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think that at the core, the problem that I've seen in you know previous companies that I've worked at is when there's that misalignment in in you know what you're apparently here to do versus how you actually make money. So that and that's typically a problem like an advertising based businesses where you know 
the, the sales team on the advertising side wants to encroach on the interface as much as possible and get people to see as many ads as possible. And you're, you know, maybe trying to, in, uh, you know, make a, a mail program, for example, you know, where you're just trying to make uh, the best possible product that uh, people say subscribe to or something like that. So when, when that misalignment occurs, I feel like that's when, when anybody uh, gets into trouble. But that's, I think, the majority also of businesses, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, one last question for you: what What is something? What is something that you've you've learned about yourself or how you're running the company in the past year that you want to take with you into a post pandemic world? Hmm. That is a tough one. Well, about me personally, right? Or, or just the way you're you're running the company. I mean, what's something that that you want to continue, you know, that that's well, work that you actually well, like. Well, I'll tell you just personally that um, you know, for the first tw more, Ben Camp has had more um, press, more um, things like this in the last twelve months than we had in our first twelve years <laughs> in, in business. And I, you know, for me, I was really I didn't start the company as somebody who. Um, was very comfortable with the idea of doing doing things uh, like this. I really was much more into um, just designing software and working working on software. So making this transition has been really really nerve wracking for me, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of becoming yeah. Dan Kemp's uh, flavor flave, I guess. <laughs> and um, and I I yeah I feel like the first few times I did this, it was a disaster and. Um, and slowly, slowly, it's become a little bit easier to do. And that's something I want to, you know, I, I know that other people have told me, both my coworkers and people outside of Bandcamp, you know, why isn't Bandcamp out there more, you know, talking itself up? And um, and the answer is because I'm super, un <laughs> super uncomfortable being that person. <laughs> uh, so, so that's one thing I would love to take out of out of this pandemic is just being able to tell the Bandcamp story and talk talk it up more because um, I think uh, you know what we're really what we're doing is really just benefiting a lot of people. Awesome, Ethan Diamond, CEO, co-founder of Bandcamp. Thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, before we go, a couple quick announcements, um, if you are still with us. We are doing another How I Built This Summit this year. Normally, we do it in San Francisco in person, but that's we can't do that because of the pandemic, and also it limits who can come. Um, this year, you can actually attend the summit from the magic and comfort of your own home. Uh, it's happening May 24th to the 27th. We're going to have incredible conversations with some amazing people like Gary Vaynerchuk and Brene Brown and Adam Grant and Sal Khan, Rashad Robinson, tons of entrepreneurs who've been on the show in the past, people you've heard. We're going to have immersive networking sessions. We're going to have uh, you know, ways to build, build and grow your community of support. We're, we're going to connect you with other people. You're going to want to check it out. And it's not so crazy expensive to attend this year. So if you want to find out more, please go to summit.npr.org. Summit.npr.org. It's going to be amazing. It supports NPR. It supports how I built this. And we are going to put on a great program of amazing content. So it's not to be missed. Um, if you haven't already done so, check out our latest episode of How I Built This with Bob and Lauren Monahan of Uppa Baby, the stroller company. It's a really cool story of how they decided to make baby strollers. Um, Bob was an, an engineer and a product designer, and he was looking at baby gates. And then he was like, wait, what about baby strollers? Really incredible story of how they did that. Uh, we'll have a new episode of How I Built This that drops on Monday. It's a story of Food 52, a story of Amanda Hester, who was a star food writer at the New York Times and left, quit. Uh, to go and start uh, her own food website, which uh, is a really cool story. Finally, if you are a fan of How I Built This, there's a book. Oh, sorry about that. There's a book out called How I Built This. It's um, not that creative of a, of a title, same name as the show, but you can find it uh, wherever you get books. Uh, and that's it for this week. We will see you back here next week. Ethan, thanks again. Thank you.